we are going to be talking about plant powerhouses and insect partners. So those really uh, important plants that are, are considered powerhouses that are uh, helping specialist bees, providing larval host plants. So we're sort of gonna go through a phenological uh, spring through fall, highlighting uh, certain plants and their insect partners. I'll pass the baton over to Sarah. She's gonna cover some of this first introductory uh, material, and then I will kick off the uh, spring plants. Hi everyone. Yeah, welcome again to the, the third day of the summit. I actually thought you were covering this part, Heather, um, <laughs> but I'll take a stab at it. So um, just giving you the basics here, what do plants provide for pollinators and other insects? We obviously often think, think first about food. So the, the nectar, the pollen from flowers, other plant tissue that feeds herbivorous insects, leaves, roots, seeds. Um, we'll talk quite a bit today about nesting sites and resources. So stems, branches, resin, leaf tissue, flower petals, stem pith, all of these are parts of plants that different insects use um, to create their homes. Um, so nesting is one type of shelter. Also, um, insects can need refuge during periods of inactivity. So it, some, some insects are active during the day. They need somewhere to hunker down at night and sometimes the opposite. Um, some insects need roosting sites like monarchs, um, hanging out in trees. Um, all of our insects need some, in this climate anyway, need somewhere to, to hunker down and overwinter in various life stages. So we'll talk through a little bit of that. Um, places to lay eggs and reproduce, find mates. Um, and then plants also provide insects with chemicals that they can in turn incorporate into their bodies and use in their own chemical defenses, use as precursors for pheromones, so finding a mate, um, cues to initiate reproductive behavior. Um, there's been a lot of research looking at the, the compounds in um, floral resources and how they might help bees it, with their immune system and fighting off diseases. So all kinds of ways that, that plants um, support insects. Do you want to take this one, Heather? Sure, thank you. Sorry about the mixed up on the <laughs> switching oh, no, back and forth. <laughs> so, um, so of course, uh, talking about our native butterflies and moths, uh, many of them have uh, very specific host plants that they require for their caterpillars to consume. And we'll be sort of highlighting some of these specialists, as I mentioned earlier, and the plants that are, are critical. And about 90% of plant feeding insects are specialists. Uh, yesterday, I highlighted uh, host or prey specificity in some of our predatory wasps. Um, butterflies need certain host plants. Of course, the, the most common uh, association that we know of is the monarch butterfly and milkweeds. But many of our insects have very close relationships with specific native plants. And then of course, looking at that from a broader perspective, their native plant communities. And uh, of course, with research um, conducted by Douglas Tallamy, and uh, he has obviously highlighted um, what are some of these powerhouse or keystone plants. And he's looked at um, various native woody plants, uh, starting with the mid-Atlantic region, but now you can enter your zip code on the National Wildlife Federation website. Uh, the URL is on the top of this slide, and you can find out what are some of the top uh, woody, in addition to perennial plants, that host the most caterpillars. Now, why is this important? Well, about 95% of our terrestrial birds are seeking out caterpillars in the landscape while they're nesting. That is the primary food source that they're feeding to their offspring. So if we can serve up these powerhouse plants in the landscapes that we're caring for, uh, we are helping to build these trophic levels that are critical for uh, organisms other than insects, uh, birds, and predatory animals 
And you can see from this slide, um, willow is one of the top uh, larval host plants hosting 355 different species of caterpillars. We'll be highlighting um, some other reasons, looking at it from the bees perspective, why willow is also extremely important. Uh, others, of course, oak hits a, is a, a big one, depending on your zip code. It can sometimes or often be uh, the number one plant hosting the most types of caterpillars. So we're looking at really improving ecosystem functionality by selecting some of these powerhouse plants that are uh, helping to build these trophic levels in our ecosystems. And uh, certain neat bees need certain plants. So there's varying degrees of specialization even with our native bees. Um, approximately 30% of native bees have some sort of specialization with a certain kind of plant pollen. Uh, there's very, uh, varying uh, categories. Polylectic bees are considered uh, generalists. They would be collecting pollen from a large variety of plants. Uh, and bringing those materials and combining them together back to back when they get back to their nest to feed their offspring. But we have very narrow specialist monolectic bees that think the females would be looking for pollen from a single plant genus. And we'll be highlighting some of those uh, plants that have monolectic specialists when we go through the growing season. Some of the top plant families that support specialists include the aster family, uh, the pea family, and then the family that the uh, willows belong to, the salicaceae family. Um, I'm gonna jump on to the next slide. Uh, Sarah, do you wanna take this one? Sure, yeah, so we're, we're gonna switch gears a little bit here and talk a little bit more in more detail about nesting and um, I have a lot of references in my slides specific to Minnesota, so I apologize to all of you who are coming from elsewhere. I'll try to um, provide the information a little bit more broadly for um, the nation as well. But here in Minnesota, we have roughly 460 different species of bees. Um, as you move towards the southwest, diversity increases. So in Arizona, there's roughly 1,300 different kinds of native bees um, in Vermont closer to 300. So every state, different states are, are you know, there's, there's a little bit of effort being put into um, trying to figure out what bees do we have and where do they live. Um, nationwide, most of our bees are nesting in the ground, roughly 70% of our bees. Here in Minnesota, um, we, yeah, we also have a lot of ground nesting bees. About 30% of our bees are using plants. And by plants, I, I, I'm kind of lumping those that nest in stems, in branches, and in wood. Um, and the main genera that, that use plants for nesting are shown here. So the small carpenter bees on the left, uh, the yellow face bees, the mason bees, and the leaf cutter bees. Uh, and yeah, I'll t I think we can we can go in a little more detail on the on the next slide, Heather, if you want to turn it. Um, so those that use stems for making their nest, um, the the nest kind of look like this. I'll just kind of dissect this with you a little bit. So um, on the left, you can see some stem stubble. This is a yard in Duluth that I just walked by, but I could tell that they were thinking about about nesting bees. Um, so rather than in the spring cutting the stems off at the ground level, which happens a lot in landscape gardens, this gardener cut them off a little higher. Um, and this stem stubble and the cut ends that they provided um, allow bees an access point to go in and make a nest. Um, over here on the right, the, this diagram is showing um, the, the inside of one of the nests. And you can see, Heather showed some great pictures of this yesterday too, but you can see there's some partitioning and some provisioning. So the, the mother bee goes in, carves out some space, um, creates separate bedrooms for each offspring and provisions each of those bedrooms with food. Um, so in the case of bees, that's a ball of pollen and nectar. In the case of the wasps, like Heather was talking about, that's often insect prey. Um, 
some of our bees also overwinter in stems. So that's what you're looking at in this left photo that we're calling hibernacula. Um, and if, if you're out there opening up stems, you can tell if it's a nest versus a, a hibernacula and overwintering site based on whether or not you see pollen provisions, if it's the right time of year, or those different, those cell walls indicating a bedroom. A lot of times in the spring, I'll open up these stems and just see a, a stem just full of little bees um, hunkered down. It's not a nest, um, but they're hunkered down for the winter together and kind of waiting for the, the, the season to warm up and for them to be able to come out and fly around. Um, some of these species also use branches and canes with hollow centers. Um, so things like sumac and box elder and elderberry. You can see um, the evidence of these bees is, if you don't see a bee itself, you can, you can sometimes tell that they've, they're either in there or were in there and have left by these perfect, perfectly circular holes. Um, here you can see a little serotina bee carving a nest out. There's this pith coming out and she's, she's making this nice entrance. Uh, this is a nest I opened up in, in a viburnum stem, a high bush cranberry stem. And it's not as perfect as those diagrams show, but you can see the yellow, these are pollen provisions. Um, there's a little, oh, you probably can't see my mouse because um, I'm not sharing my slides, but there's a little larva over on the right. Um, on the left, you can see a pile of raspberry canes that we encourage this land manager to, rather than burn, um, just leave so that the whatever was nesting in there would have a chance to emerge the following season. So that's one strategy as land managers you can think about leaving, maybe not necessarily saving everything, but, but trying to think of some of what we would think of as waste um, as potentially homes for a lot of different things. Here's just a quick list of some of the wildflowers and shrubs that are pretty highly used by stem nesters. This We pulled this out of a resource that Heather and I worked on with the University of Minnesota Bee Lab. Um, I guess in my own experience, I would probably call out Monarda and Hyssop as pretty much every stem I cut to provide a nesting site gets, gets occupied. So that's pretty fun to see. And then for the shrubs, the, the raspberries and the sumac, um, I found nests in every kind of sumac that we have in Minnesota. Heather showed a great uh, slide yesterday of a wasp that uses sumac for nesting. I think we can go to the next one. Unless, Heather, if you wanna chime in on any of this, feel free. Sounds good. I think you've got a bit of a delay for slide advance, so I'll just plan on that. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, okay, so we've got the ones that nest in, in stems and, and branches. There's also quite a few of these plant using bees that nest in dead wood. Um, and a lot of times these, these bees are using the tunnels left behind by wood boring beetles. Um, you can tell, so you're looking at some of the holes here uh, left by the beetles. So that's a perfect place for a bee to move in and make her home. You can tell when one of these holes has been occupied because you'll see it capped off. Um, the bee doesn't leave it open. She caps it and often it's, it's various materials. So it could be mud or resin. This photo on the right I like because it's just showing a kind of a creative way to use a stump, leave a stump in your yard. This is another yard in Duluth. I think that's all, Heather. Oh yeah, boring bees lead to interesting, boring beetles lead to interesting bees. Um, rotting logs. Both Heather and I really, really appreciate logs um, for their value to so many animals and fungi. Um, logs are, important at all stages of decay. You can find certain things living in, in dead wood that still has the bark on and certain things that will only use logs that are almost turned into soil. Uh, here are a few examples of logs that support uh, a little green 
B, a green sweat bee, Agochlora pura, which is pretty unique because most of the sweat bees nest in soil, but this one has adapted or evolved to, to exclusively use like really well decomposed wood. Um, this is a, a nest that Heather saw being excavated. And the nests are more similar to the type of nest structure you see in soil. So rather than a linear series, it's more of a tunnel with different branches coming off of it. Oh, Heather also documented this lazy oglossum. So another, another type of sweat bee using well decomposed wood. Yeah, in fact, the, the pure green sweat bee and this species were nesting in the same uh, old mossy box elder log on the ground. And um, the, the log, the one thing to keep in mind is bees, I found that they generally avoid really damp or wet wood, but they're looking for, as you can tell in this picture, um, wood that is sort of dry rotting and, and um, easy for them to sort of excavate and expand those uh, nesting burrow and cavities that Sarah talked about. Oh yeah, so another really neat resource used by some of our bees, um, actually just exclusively our leaf cutter bees, are leaves. And so these leaf cutter bees, the megachile, they make their nests um, in either in the ground or in dead wood, or they also are, are a type of bee that will use the, the straws or tubes that, that people put out. But when they, when they partition those cells and make those bedrooms, they wrap them in leaves. So it's kind of, I think of it kind of like wallpaper. Um, and the leaf material that they're using in their, in their um, cells and nest construction is providing important micro, micro, um, microbial protection so, um, and disease prote protection and moisture regulation. Um, they are, they, they're out there using quite a few different types of leaves, but they do have preferences. So I think that's always fun to pay attention to. These are all different types of plants that I've seen them collecting, collecting leaf tissue from just here in, in the North Woods of, of Minnesota. Um, raspberry, rose, uh, yeah, native honeysuckle. Um, Heather found this one on red oak, which is a little bit unusual. They're, they really commonly use ash, black ash, green ash, um, primrose. Yeah, sumac, just a fun thing to start watching for. And you, you, you can tell it's a evidence of a leaf cutter bee versus some other like caterpillar herbivory just by how how perfect that circle is circle or oval um and they they make those circles by cutting they have they have strong mandibles that are sharp and kind of scissors like and they cut these perfect circles and then carry them home i think i have a video we'll see if this will work so this is a, a Female leaf cutter bee, um, early spring. I've seen them nesting in the same place in my front yard two years in a row now, and um, it just looks like that. So sh she's flying home with a big, a big leaf wrapped under her body, um, pulling it down underground, and a few, probably a minute or so later, coming back up and doing it again and again. Um, I watched this nest for about two days before she had sealed it all up and um, that was it. You can also see around the entrance all these pieces of kind of slate um, that she actually excavated out. So people don't always think of the leaf cutters as, as doing the soil excavation, but they, they definitely do. Leaf litter is another resource we want to talk about because it's a little bit underappreciated. Um, we all like to rake our leaves and get them get them off site, but decomposing leaves provide really critical overwintering habitat for all kinds of insects. A few years ago, Xerxes launched this Leave the Leaves campaign, um, and all of these images are available on our website if you want to download them and, and print them off and put them, people put them up in their yards to kind of justify to their neighbors or explain to their neighbors what, what we're doing here. But caterpillars of fritillary butterflies overwinter in fall leaves. Um, 
bumblebee queens use fall use fall leaves. Um, so yeah, leaves are not litter. Leave the leaves. Uh, this is a a document that's linked in the um, the notes on the summit page that I would recommend you check out. But it basically highlights all these different categories of nesting resources. So plant stems, uh, leaf litter, rock piles, brush piles, and the types of insects that they support. Uh, this photo on the right is just showing that there are ways to, you know, leave a lot of this plant material and also have it look a little bit intentional um, by using things like, like this rock, rock wall border edging pathways. Um, and I also, I just want to point out, it, I mean, it, it really is intentional. We've taken away so much of the habitat for these, these animals. Um, so many parts of our landscape are really manicured or paved over or completely developed. Um, so anything we can do to try to bring as much of these, as much of this back, I think is, is really important. So next we're going to be, as I mentioned, going through the um, various seasons, talking about what are some of these high value pollinator plants. So plants that are um, not only perhaps providing larval food for various butterfly and moth caterpillars, but very nutritious resources, pollen and or nectar for many of our uh, pollinating and flower visiting insects. And, and the amazing thing is some of these powerhouse plants are um, providing food for one or more specialists that really don't, can't feed on much else. So this is their only game in town. And um, that's why with Sarah mentioning, you know, our landscapes are highly fragmented. A lot of these really uh, important and unique plants that these specialists rely on are largely absent. So this is just one way that we can really help uh, stitch back habitat and support some of these uh, rarer specialist species. And some of these plants, as Sarah's already highlighted, are also providing um, nesting resources. So the, the specific types of flowering plants that their stems then become um, ideal nesting sites for some of our cavity nesting species. So really the, the message here is diversity is the key. That's always a good rule of thumb, depending on where you're um, adding more habitat, whether it's in your home garden or perhaps you're doing a planting at your place of worship or helping restore one of your neighborhood parks. We always wanna think about uh, flowering plant diversity, making sure that we have things blooming from early spring all the way through to late fall. That is, that's really important. I call it the, the, the pollinator or the flower buffet restaurant is open 24 seven for the entire growing season. And it can be difficult in some situations. Um, often people overlook uh, spring and fall. So we'll be highlighting some of those important plants to think about. I call them the bookend plants uh, to make sure you have that continuous succession of flowering plants through the growing season. So I'm going to talk about some spring blooming species and then I'll pass it back over to Sarah to cover some uh, summer blooming species and then I'll be touching on some fall blooming species for you to think about. And we realize that some of you are tuning in from uh, various places throughout the country. So some of these plants we are highlighting uh, are more Midwestern and Northeastern in their native range, but um, just take notes of the genera or similar plants in the same family that what you could apply to the area that you live in. So as I, we've already, go oh, ahead, Heather, start. I was just gonna say, maybe even before we get going on this, it might be worth pointing out to people that, so there's a resource um, called Bonap, on online where you can go in and just type, if you type the word BONAP, B-O-N-A-P, and then the genus that we're talking about, um, you will get um, a series of maps. So a bunch of maps, the first one showing the um, distribution of that genus nationwide, but then all the other maps will show the different species in the genus and where they occur nationwide. So that might be a helpful way for you to 
to quickly see, okay, what species in this genus makes sense for me in Florida or, you know, Washington, wherever you might be tuning in from. Um, yeah, that's all. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Sarah. And I would note too, um, just pay attention to the color coding on Bonap. Um, the, yes. the, bright, the bright green means native to that particular county. They, they have it colored down to the county level, but the um, introduced, uh, it's a plant occurring outside of its range. The color is uh, almost of a, a teal. So sometimes at first glance, if you're new to Bonap, um, they can be, those colors can be differ, difficult to differentiate. So just take a look at the color coding map while you're on Bone App and make sure um, you understand which colors are indicating whether the plant is in fact native to where you live or, or it's being grown, but it has been introduced to that area. All right, so kicking off the spring um, here in Minnesota, in addition to some of our other northern states, uh, willow is usually one of the first uh, flowering plants that blooms in spring. Um, sometimes here in Minnesota, the red maples will bloom just before the willows, but I often head out in spring knowing that I'll find some of the first bees flying around uh, the flowering willows. Here uh, in Minnesota, pussy willow generally blooms first, so if you know where there's a nice patch of uh, pussy willow perhaps growing at the edge of the woodland, What's really interesting about our willow species is they have separate male and female plants. So the female plants are uh, serving up nectar to flower visiting insects. And then the male plants, of course, are serving up pollen in addition to some nectar. Uh, you'll, you're going to find in some cases, uh, many solitary male bees flying around or almost looks like they're swarming. Uh, flowering willows in the spring. And what they're doing is they're uh, waiting for the females to emerge from, from the nest and then fly to a willow plant. And that's their opportunity to mate with the females. So, um, so you, well, excuse me. <laughs> so you'll find some of the first uh, emerging bumblebee species here in Minnesota. I often see the uh, two spotted bumblebee queens. So they've been hibernating in the winter. They dig a shallow burrow in the ground. Um, in the previous fall, they've done a lot of feeding on very sugar rich nectars to build up fat stores. And they are essentially burning through those fat stores as they hibernate for the winter. So when they come out of hibernation in the spring, when, when the day length is right and the soil temperatures start to warm, um, they are absolutely famished. And so flowering plants such as willow are providing that first sort of nectar source for queens so that the queens have enough energy to start their nest searching activity, which can last for anywhere from seven to 12 days uh, while they're out searching for a nice place to nest. And then, as I mentioned, the male willow flowers are producing pollen and for some of those really early emerging solitary bees, that's extremely important because as you can see on this slide, there are 14 unique um, bee species that specialize on just collecting uh, willow pollen. And willow pollen is very nutritious. Uh, one study demonstrated that the pollen protein content was 40%. Um, pollen protein content can vary between two and 60%, depending on the plant. Um, but so 40% is, is quite good from a nutritional standpoint. And you also may spot some specialists. So this is one of the willow, one of the 14 uh, pollen collecting willow specialists, uh, Andrina endronoides. And these females like to nest in bare compacted sand. So again, I was talking about those habitat components yesterday with wasps, but the same holds true for some of our native bee species that have um, pretty narrow preferences of the soil type that they may be nesting in. And then in the case of these plant pollen specialists, uh, they need to have an ideal nesting site that's located in close proximity to that pollen source. So this medium sized bee, uh, the mining bee, about the size of a honeybee, um, she's not gonna fly much more than four or 500 yards to find her pollen source. So thinking about those, 
um, broader habitat components and specific needs of some of our pollinating insects. And then willow, as we talked about earlier, being a keystone plant is providing uh, a foliage that many different species of caterpillars are feeding on. So 355 different species here. In our uh, zip code, it could be a little bit more or a little bit less, depending on uh, you, where you are tuning in from. Some specific willow species that I wanted to highlight. Uh, Bebs willow is a fairly clump forming willow, not, not too big, um, really likes wet habitats. So that's one of the challenges of trying to incorporate willows into home gardens. Uh, we often don't have the right site conditions. People can sex, sex, excuse me, successfully try and grow pussy willow if they have uh, a moist location or heavier soils. And then for drier situations, but particularly if you're in the Midwest, um, prairie willow is also a, a really interesting species. It, now, many willows are spreading, um, so don't maybe don't plan on planting a willow if you have a really small um, urban property, for example. Uh, next up, so we uh, see some of those first deciduous trees bloom, such as red maple, some of the early flowering woody plants, such as willow. And then when we start moving into our more woodland habitat, uh, those first spring ephemeral species, in addition to some that are not ephemeral, but bloom in the spring before the leaves emerge on the canopy trees. This is one of my favorites, um, the Virginia water leaf belongs to the borage family. Uh, the, the nectar is very nutritious and sought after by a number of different flower visiting insects. But you also, if you get up a little bit closer and look at um, what some of the different flower visitors, you're going to find some of our smaller solitary bee species like that pure green or that green metallic sweat bee that I have pictured here. She's crunching herself around the pollen producing anthers. Um, starting to collect pollen to take that back to her nest. And um, for those of you that still live in the areas where the rusty patch bumblebee occurs, um, the new queens are often using uh, Virginia water leaf as a nectar source, likely um, right around the same time that they are establishing a nest. And so that nectar provides them with the fuel they need for nest searching and starting to provision the nest that they've established. We do have one uh, monolectic, so very narrow specialist, uh, the bee in the Andrina or mining bee genus pictured here. And the females only collect pollen from the plants in the genus Hydrophyllum. So they are a little bit, if you're familiar with mining bees and their general size, um, this particular species is a little bit smaller, um, somewhere between a, a sweat bee and perhaps a honey bee. Other woodland and savanna flowering plants, uh, wild geranium, this is a really fun plant to watch for flower development. Um, the flowers produce pollen first, followed by having the stigma, stigmas become receptive to pollen. So you're going to get different visitation behaviors depending on the, the, the state or the part of, or where the flower is in its development. So these two pictures that I'm showing of the small carpenter bee and the metallic green sweat bee, the flowers are producing pollen. And so that's really going to influence whether it's the female bee visiting the flower for pollen collection, or perhaps it's a male bee that may be just seeking out nectar. And nectar starts to get produced um, closer to the time that the stigma becomes receptive to pollen. But earlier on, you're going to find various solitary bees, such as the orchard mason bee pictured here. And she belongs to the leafcutter bee family. And those bees collect pollen on hairs on the bottom of their abdomen. So she has a really kind of fun, fast uh, foraging behavior on wild geranium, dives in, and then brushes all of that pollen onto those hairs on the bottom of, them, of her abdomen. We do have one um, strict monolectic specialist of wild geranium, this mining bee, Andrina distance. And that's female, you can see she's actually 
uh, consuming the pollen in that image. And geranium pollen, is it's really fun to photograph bees on geranium because the pollen grains are really big and um, just fun to, to, you get really great photos. Uh, sometimes this uh, monolithic specialist, this picture is unusual in that I usually find the females upside down. And so they're uh, rapidly brushing that pollen as they have their abdomen sticking up in the air uh, so that the their pollen collecting structures on their hind legs are closer to where the pollen is being produced on the flower. Other spring blooming plants, uh, violets, many of our violet spe species like partial shade or you find them in more woodland environments, but we do have the uh, prairie violet pictured on that bottom right image that you'll find in more open sunny grassland habitats. Uh, violets are producing both pollen and nectar. Um, the nectar is pretty concealed, so way back in the back of the flower is where the nectary is located. So that can be quite a challenge depending on the type of uh, flower visitor, whether or not they can successfully get their tongues back to the back of where that flower nectary occurs. But violets are a larval host plant for 30 different species of butterflies and moss. And that uh, includes some that I'll have on the next slide, <laughs> but um, talking about bee visitation, one fun thing to look for for bees visiting violets is the small and medium sized solitary bees will often do this upside down foraging. And for the very reason that I talked about, those nectaries are really concealed way back at the back of the flower. So they can get their tongue um, a little bit further inserted into the flower if they do this upside down foraging. Um, the other really fun thing about violets is larger bees such as bumblebees will uh, buzz pollinate the flowers to extract the pollen. And you can imagine that these delicate violet flowers, uh, a little, a large um, bumblebee uh, landing on them, the, the flower often gets pulled down to the ground because of the weight of the bumblebee. And so the queen, new queens or perhaps some of the first workers will visit violets, uh, vibrate their thoracic muscles, so they're buzzing um, that flower or shaking it at a high frequency and um, extracting the pollen in that way. And violets, as I mentioned, host 30 different butterfly and moth uh, species. The caterpillars feed only on violets. These are just some examples. Uh, many of our fritillary species are, their host plants are violets. So the picture on the left is a female variegated fritillary and she's uh, way down on the ground, uh, lay, inserting, touching her abdomen on the underside of the leaf to lay an egg. And uh, another common species in Midwestern prairies is the great spangled fritillary and females also rely on violets. What's interesting about um, Use that, what, that picture is um, sort of unusual because often fritillary butterflies will lay their egg not directly on the host plant, but on grasses that are growing near the host plant. And then the caterpillars need to crawl from the grassy area to their host plant. And this is often when they can get impacted, particularly in lawns. If people start mowing too early in the spring, those caterpillars can get impacted from mowing. And a lot of the feeding of the fritillary caterpillars occurs at night. I've never um, seen a feeding caterpillar on violets. So I suppose I need to become a night owl and get out there and look for them. Um, so during the day they're, they're hiding out and trying to avoid getting predated upon by birds, for example. Other um, butterfly and moth species that rely on violets include the great leopard moth, uh, the nice tiger moth and the large yellow underwing. All right, so we kind of moved from uh, woody flowering plants in wetlands, uh, woodland uh, blooming plants under tree canopies, and now we're getting later into spring and some of the first uh, prairie and savanna species begin to bloom. So golden alexanders plants, uh, we have two species here in Minnesota in the genus Dizia. Uh, beautiful plants, They're, they belong to the carrot family, so they have those typical umbel-shaped flowers with many very shallow 
uh, florets. I talked about that yesterday with the wasps. This is a popular plant with some of the earlier emerging wasp species because the flowers are so shallow. Uh, any bees with um, very short tongues or wasps that are short tongue can easily access the nectar. You will also find some early butterflies, such as the spring azure, using the uh, plants for flower nectar. There is one uh, pollen collecting specialist of Zizia, but um, this species, Andrina zizia, may be more of a broader specialist and also utilizing pollen from other plants in the carrot family. Uh, the females are quite tiny and um, you, if you look closely and are in the right spot where they occur, um, I often see that this particular pollen collecting specialist. You will also find black swallowtail caterpillars. So if you're not growing their typical um, plants that they like in your herb garden, such as parsley, um, they will utilize golden alexanders. So uh, the plant is not only providing pollen for specialists, nectar for a variety of different flower visiting insects, but also a larval host plant. Uh, with that, we're, I'm going to pass it back to Sarah to talk about some summer blooming species. And of course, there's plenty to choose from. So we're just highlighting uh, some of these powerhouses that you think that may be interesting. Thanks so much, Heather. Yeah, so we're starting with Physalis. Um, this is a plant that doesn't get a lot of attention, um, and it's it's also not very commercially available. Um, but we wanted to include it because of these specialist bee relationships, in particular, that Heather's been talking about. So here um, in Minnesota, we have a couple of widespread species. The the plant occurs nationwide, so you might have some other ones. The fruit is enclosed in this papery husk. Um, the plant is in the Solanaceae family, so ground cherry, um, tomatoes, potatoes. They do, the flowers don't produce nectar, so they're not visited for nectar, but they do produce really critical pollen for certain bees. Um, and this is another example of a flower that's buzz pollinated. So Heather was just talking about this, where the plant will only, in this case, the plant will only release its pollen when um, it's vibrated at a certain frequency. And here are just a couple examples of those specialist bees. So um, the Caledes feed exclusively on the pollen of this genus. Um, the, the Perdita and Lazio blossom are, are feed pretty preferentially on, on this plant. All, those are all ground nesting bees. As far as the Lepidoptera, um, this plant hosts a, a number of specialist leaf miners. I talked about the leaf miners um, on Tuesday and also owlet moths along with some other more generalist moths. And here I just want to point out um, even some of these specialist caterpillars have specialists that in turn feed on them. So you can see this little tiny wasp, the parasitoid wasp, that feeds exclu exclusively on the caterpillar uh, of the leaf miner. Lots of intricate relationships going on. Um, and I'm Heather, I'm just gonna pick up the pace a little bit for the sake of time. So uh, with the, the mountain mints, Heather talked quite a bit about, about this plant yesterday in the context of wasps. Um, we have just one species here, but as you move south and east, especially you, you have a lot more diversity they're really a nectar plant, produce abundant nectar that attracts so many different types of insects. This is the plant that if I if I want to see something new that I've never seen before, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably see it on this plant. Pollen is generally not gathered. Lots of different wasps, um, 95 species of wasps in 42 genera use this plant, according to Heather's fantastic book. Dahlia was also touched on yesterday. Um, where do I want to go here? So kind of an, a spectacular little flower. It opens from the bottom up and provides resources for a relatively long period of time, about a month, visited by a wide variety of bees. The pollen in this flower is bright orange, so sometimes you'll see bumblebees just 
laden with with these um what do you call the pollen the the pollen packets um really colorful the main species that that we wanted to talk about here is this little perdita perpalida it's a little fairy bee that feeds exclusively on the pollen of dahlia um, on the left that silky prairie clover you can see how tiny the bee is relative to our fingers um and this plant is also a host plant for i don't know of any specialists but but a number of generalists um Lepidoptera that feed kind of generalists in that they feed broadly on the legumes. So things like the blues, some of the sulfurs. Monarda, I mean, we just couldn't leave this one out. Monarda gets a lot of attention, um, but it really deserves it. So Monarda fistulosa and punctata are the two common ones in Minnesota. Again, we've got nectar as a primary reward for all kinds of bees and wasps, other insects, pollen generally not gathered except by some really special little specialists. I think we have a picture on the next slide of one of them. Um, and as far as the Lepidoptera, so this genus hosts the hermit sphinx moth, a few smelt, snout moths um, that specialize on, on the mint family a little more broadly, also some tortricid moths. This is a, a genus I pointed out earlier that the stems are so popular with serotina bees and, and some others. Native thistles. Xerces talks a lot about native thistles. Um, we, we released this conservation practitioner's guide a few years ago, just, just in light of the fact that thistles are really, they, they get a lot of negative attention because we have so many, many invasive and noxious ones, but we also have all these native ones that a lot of plants have really tight relationships with and, and depend on. Um, so they're providing nectar, pollen, we have a bunch of specialist bees. Um, there's some Lepidoptera that feed exclusively on thistles, um, including a, a pretty at-risk species that's still hanging on in Wisconsin, the, the swamp metal mark. Also, I wanted to point out, for those of you who collect native thistle seed, um, sometimes you'll see these little caterpillars, homeosoma caterpillars, that feed on the seeds of thistles. Just doing a time check. So um, milkweeds, a uh, really popular, popular plant genus, another one that we get gets a lot of attention, but we just couldn't leave it out. There's there's a milkweed for absolutely everybody across the United States. One of the cool things about milkweed is the pollen is not um, available loosely. Instead, it's packaged in what are called pollinia. And the pollen is not gathered intentionally by bees, um, but and actually can be kind of troublesome, but the the bees and wasps, and in this case, a fly, um, can, can just get almost attacked by pollenia that, that hang on to their legs and they, they fly around with it on them and will get their legs stuck in the flower of another milkweed and those pollenia will, will slip off and that's how the pollination happens. Uh, abundant nectar produced by these plants, really attractive floral reward. Um, it's another great wasp plant, 89 different wasp species in our region. Another cool thing about milkweed is it, it has these plant chemistries that, um, like I mentioned earlier, that the insects can accumulate into their own bodies and um, help render them less less susceptible to predation. So this this milkweed longhorn beetle on the left is able to just hang out like that up on a flower, bright red, um, because its predators know that it's distasteful. We've got you know we know about milkweeds and their relationship to to monarchs, of course, but there are other Lepidoptera that have that type of a tight relationship as well, including the milkweed tussock moth, which sometimes people see they plant their milkweed for monarchs and end up with a lot of tussock moths. That, that's just as cool, in my opinion. Vervain, another genus um, that we're, we're highlighting for its uh, uh, attractiveness to specialists. It's, it makes a lot of nectar. Um, 
Also, like the dahlia has a long flowering period starting from the bottom, moving up, ongoing supply of resources. And the specialist bee that we're pointing out here is this Caliopsis, a, a little mining bee. As far as Lepidoptera, it's a host plant for the verbena moth. Um, and common buckeye is a, is a generalist Lepidoptera that feeds on the, the tissue of these leaves. All right, so we're going to move on to some of those uh, fall bookend plants. And uh, depending, I think most of you could probably plant a variety of goldenrods and asters and fill that fall bookend, but uh, we'll be highlighting a few other species and, and thinking about these various flower visiting insects and why fall blooming plants are important. We have migratory species, including the monarch butterfly. And butterflies are seeking out um, flowering plants that are providing nectar, um, but that nectar needs to be nutritious in order for them to produce uh, eggs, in addition to have enough uh, fuel for their migration in the fall. So looking at this study that was conducted in 2017, it's highlighting amino acid concentration in various native uh, flowering plant nectars. And the ones that I've highlighted include um, the asters, the goldenrods, the sunflowers in the genus Helianthus. Um, Coreopsis is also a very nutritious nectar source for butterfly species. Uh, in addition, the, the top one at the far right of that graphic is Vernonia, our, our native iron weeds. So we can think about these plant powerhouses in, in terms of what sort of uh, floral resources they're providing, but also the quality of the floral resources. As I mentioned earlier, those uh, new queen bumblebees are looking for flower nectars that have high sugar concentrations so that they can build up those fat stores to, to survive their winter hibernation. Um, some sunflower species. So sunflower is really a, one of the top powerhouse plants for fall, um, hosting 58 different species of butterflies and moths. And um, sunflowers are a lot of them, a lot of the species are rhizomatous, so they can be a pretty fast spreading species and may not be appropriate for uh, smaller landscapes. But if you can find a place to plant a, a sunflower native to your area, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, the flowering plants, uh, the helianthus, belong to the aster family, so the flowers are producing both pollen and nectar. And there are 99 different specialist bee species that rely on um, uh, sunflower pollen. So one great reason to plant a sunflower if you have the appropriate conditions and space. Um, we also thought that we'd highlight black-eyed Susans, even though some are um, summer blooming, but uh, some, some such as the Rudbeckia herda can act kind of like a annual, sometimes a biannual or short-lived perennial. And you often get re-blooming occurring with that particular species. So it will um, produce additional flowers later in the summer into autumn. And these plants also belong to the aster family, producing both uh, pollen and nectar. Uh, Rudbeckia is the larval host plant for 15 different butterfly and moss species. And we have three native species here in Minnesota. Um, Rudbeckia subtomentoso is also sold regularly by many of our native plant nurseries. It's a wonderful savanna plant um, tolerating partial shade. So if you're gardening in more shady conditions, that would be one to investigate for late summer, early fall bloom. And the pollen is sought after by various uh, solitary bee species. You'll find a, it's another uh, plant to sit and watch um, just for uh, flower visiting diversity. The paranthidium bee that I have pictured on that upper left is a pollen specialist of plants in the aster family. So again, the, the individual bee's phenology and what particular plants it overlaps with will dictate um, what are their pollen sources if their um, specialization is a little bit more broad, such as an entire plant family. And you will also find various uh, butterflies, moss, and other 
nectar feeding insects visiting black-eyed Susans as well. And then we can't go wrong by trying to incorporate at least three different aster species in our gardens. Um, and you can really almost have a complete flowering phenology from mid-August into early, uh, late October. And in some cases, if you live farther south than Minnesota, um, early November. So we have such a wide variety of aster species to choose from. Um, the plant was, the, the genus was recently reclassified and to a couple of genera. So just pay attention if some of our native plant nurseries are still using the um, genus aster instead of the um, newer classified genera. But the species I have highlighted here, uh, the Eurebia macrophylla, the large leaved aster is uh, an aster that grows in savannas and woodlands, so it's fairly shade tolerant. And then the um, Symphiotrichum ericoides is um, blooms very late in the fall. It's also the common name for that species is heath aster. So there are eight different butterflies and moss species that utilize asters as larval host plants. And we also, of course, have some solitary bee species, primarily bees in the mining bee family that are provisioning their nests with aster pollen. So there's uh, these specialists generally are looking for pollens from plants in the aster family in late summer, autumn, and those are generally the asters and goldenrods. So these, and you think about it, these, these females have a very short window of time to find an adequate supply of pollen, provision their nests, build all those brood cells that we talked about um, before uh, our temperatures really start to get cold and winter is on its way. And finally, goldenrod, um, um, going, I'm sure most of you now or know that goldenrod does not cause allergies. The pollen, in, in fact, is very sticky and not windborne. Um, people used to associate uh, their hay fever, but it, goldenrod was blooming at the same time as ragweed. So help us educate others that goldenrod doesn't cause allergies. And we have many different goldenrod species to choose from, uh, growing in various habitats. So the Solidago nemoralis, pic pictured in the middle, um, thrives in sandy habitats. We have goldenrod species that like moisture conditions. The, the rigid or stiff goldenrod is in a particularly uh, adaptive and attractive clump forming goldenrod. So not all goldenrods are very really aggressive like Canada goldenrod. So there are many to choose from that would be appropriate for your garden conditions. And there are larval host plants for 88 different species of butterflies and moss. And then of course those Solitary bees that I mentioned earlier that are aster specialists while they're actively provisioning their nests in late summer and autumn. So they're utilizing the pollen from goldenrods and asters. And these are just two examples on this slide. One, one of my favorite bees is the hairy banded mining bee. The females are, they look like little uh, teddy bears. And then goldenrods are, of course, being in the aster family are also producing nectar. So good fuel up plant for new queen bumblebees, building fat stores for migrating butterflies, uh, very nutritious uh, nectar source as well. And Sarah is just gonna highlight some of the resources, but as Lori mentioned, there are links to the resources um, and on the summit webpage. Yeah, so thank you, Heather. Um, and, and I'll go quick through this just for the sake of time again, but lots of stuff on the Xerces website. I, I should have pointed this out when I was talking about milkweeds, but if you want to search for um, the milkweeds in your region, you can you can go to Xerces and search regional milkweed guide and find some pretty nice regional guides um, that highlight the main species for you. Um, let's go to the next slide. Heather's website has a lot of different um, really useful resources linking up native plants and the insects that use them. Um, next slide, some of Heather's books, bees, wasps, um, the hoverfly book too. Um, we pulled a lot of our content from Jared Fowler's website. Jared's a former coworker of mine and 
Um, Heather and I were mostly using this pollen specialist bees of the central United States, but he has pages on other regions if you want to dig a little deeper into the specialist bees for you. Um, we talked about BONAP. The eco-regional revegetation application tool is another one that I would check 